letter of satisfaction or satisfaction of mortgage. Now that homeowner paid off all their debt and they don't know they don't know anything anymore. It's called a satisfaction of mortgage. Again, the defeasance clause is a clause that's going to help out that client. They're going to get a letter of satisfaction within 60 days, and that also is going to get recorded, indicated that they've completed their obligation, that this property is free and cleared, and that it is unencumbered. Defeasance clause. So that defeasance clause, again, comes from the word defeat, that we've defeated the right of the bank to take uh, away our property through a foreclosure proceeding. So it's called a defeasance clause, and we get a letter of satisfaction within 60 days from the bank. Okay, defeasance clause. <clears throat> okay, we mentioned uh, uh, an exculpatory clause. If we've, we mentioned the deficiency judgment. Okay, so that property that sells for $400,000, uh, it got sold in an auction for $300,000, then there's a deficiency. And that bank is going to come after you for that $100,000. Okay, but if they forgive you, if they forgive, condonar means to forgive, now, this is called the exculpatory clause, the exculpatory clause, okay? In the exculpatory clause, they're going to forgive this debt, all right? But I don't think you, you know, don't, don't expect to see it in your contract, all right? But it's called an exculpatory clause, whereby they forgive the deficiency judgment. Most people think that they have it on their contract when I mention this, and I have to reemphasize that, that, uh, well, everything is negotiable, but again, uh, don't count on the bank uh, making, making that offer to you. Okay, the liens. Voluntary liens, the following are voluntary liens, a mortgage lien and a vendor's lien. A mortgage lien, let's say for instance the house is worth $100,000, this property is worth $100,000, okay, the purchase price is $100,000, but the bank is only going to lend the borrower 80% LTV, 80%, okay. Well, the seller in this particular case can offer to help them finance it, and this is called a vendor's lien, a vendor's lien with a purchase money mortgage. A vendor's lien and the parties to this type of lien is the vendor and the vendee the seller and the buyer okay so these are the two types of liens that are voluntary a mortgage lien and a vendor's lien the following are involuntary liens so again if you don't pay your state tax you're gonna have a state tax lien if you don't if, uh, if they sued you for some reason and they put a, a lien over your property and you have a judgment lien again for that hundred thousand dollars your deficiency or maybe you're deficient in something else then they can put a judgment lien on you income tax liens if you don't pay your income tax homeowners association estate tax lien property tax liens construction liens special assessment and again if you're going through a foreclosure uh, process it's called the list pendants list pendants okay so again we have the voluntary liens and the involuntary liens and again, if it's any type of liens, it's always going to get recorded. And again, the purpose of recording that is to create constructive notice, constructive notice. Okay, so the idea, again, is to uh, start working your area, start working your market. Okay, here, uh, fortunately, fortunately in Florida, and uh, we have beautiful houses, we have uh, beautiful seasons, uh, tropical seasons here. Again, so if you decide that you want to move down here, I'd be more than happy to help you out. I'm also a licensed real estate agent, licensed real estate, uh, licensed uh, mortgage broker. So again, the idea is to uh, make uh, take advantage of those licenses too, because there's again properties out there that are million dollar properties you can be working. So again, set your goals high, even if you don't aim, uh, if, you, if you don't hit the mark of a, of a five or ten million dollar home, well maybe you can hit something in between that. All right, so something in between of ten million dollars is not still not too bad. All right. So again, but you for the most part, the average houses uh, here in the area uh, are going for four hundred thousand dollars. So again, the idea is always to uh, ask for an eight percent commission. The average commission is six percent, but my recommendation is try to get it at eight because again, you want to keep three percent as the listing agent, but you want to offer five percent to the buyer's agent who's going to bring you the buyer. So it's, particularly in this type of market, you want to incentivize the market so they can bring you a buyer. Okay, so at least. Even if they bring you a buyer with this type of, in this particular example, you're still going to make $8,400 if you're a 70% commission. Okay, so the idea is not to get too greedy and give the other side a little bit more money so you can start making money. Okay, as a broker, again, you're going to have uh, your agency and you're going to have what's called a brokerage relationship disclosures. These are the forms, the documents that we have to give our clients. Uh, prior to going into a transaction. So it's called a brokerage relationship disclosures. <clears throat> you have the single agent, transaction broker, and no brokerage relationship. 
in a single agent you're going to be able to work with the seller or the buyer and you're going to be working in a fiduciary capacity fiduciary comes from the word fidelity okay loyalty and again uh, to give you the example for example uh, the uh, divorce attorney cannot be representing a divorce lawyer cannot be re representing the husband and the wife because that that would not be, be fiduciary to the both okay so in this particular case a single agent cannot be fiduciary to the seller and the buyer if he works with both of them he would be considered a dual agent and that would be considered I illegal okay so we can work in a, in a fiduciary capacity we can work either with the seller or the buyer but we cannot work with both at the same time and this type of relationship the client is called a principal a principal and they have the, the number nine represents the nine duties that that single agent has uh, to that client in a transaction broker it's seven duties that that uh, agent is going to have with the seller and the buyer so now in this particular relationship in a transaction broker the agent can represent the seller and the buyer but the representation is going to be limited limited okay so if you get a question or asking you something about the representation uh, that is going to be a limited representation then the answer should be transaction broker transaction broker and the client is referred to as the customer the customer <clears throat> and no brokerage relationship here the for sale by owner uh, found his own buyer and doesn't need the help of a real estate agency uh, to market or help procure a buyer for them but what they do need is maybe help with the paperwork with the contracts so that's called a no brokerage relationship okay so these are the three types of relationships uh, that we have but for the most part we're going to be looking at the transaction broker uh, relationship again as a transaction broker it allows me to work with the seller and the buyer and again I'm able to make two commissions at the same time okay so again that's the, a typical transaction that we're going to be working as a transaction uh, broker now if I'm working as a single agent working with a buyer but I just found uh, I'm sorry if I'm working with the seller as a single agent and I just found the buyer then I cannot work with both because again that would be a dual agent so in order for me to make the transition then that seller has to sign a consent to transition to transaction broker okay so again they have to consent to the consent to transition to transaction broker relationship okay and that's going to be the only way that I'm going to be able to work with them now the single agent transaction broker no brokerage relationship at the end of the contract it has a space uh, for those sellers to sign those documents or the buyers to sign the, the, doc, the document the signature in that particular case is not uh, an obligation it's not mandatory but if I'm working as a single agent and working with the seller and I found the buyer now in this particular case this document has to be signed by that seller in order for me to work with both with the seller and the buyer so in the consent to transition broker that document has to be signed designated sales associates in residential transactions we already talked about residential residential is uh, any property four or less units it could be a uh, vacant lot where you can construct four or less houses on it or it can be an agricultural property of 10 or less acres so for the most part we're going to be working residential properties now when it comes to designated sales associates if you're working with the seller and the buyer in a residential property in a fiduciary capacity as a single agent this is also known as a dual agent and it's illegal okay in espanol it's illegal 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 or Ill illegal but in non-residential non-residential transactions okay you can work with the seller and the buyer if the seller and the buyer have over one million dollars in assets you can work with them in a fiduciary capacity it is legal and the agents that are going to be working are called designated sales associates designated sales associates and you can represent the client in a non-resident residential transaction as single agent okay but they have to have the seller and the buyer have to have a uh, million dollars in assets 